I probably really don't need this, but Dwayne Crowther is a highly published uh, author, has written many books, and uh, is you can buy his books at uh, Deseret Book and Mostly at ldshorizonpublishers.com. ldshorizonpublishers.com. And he has some very interesting subjects that he has written on. And tonight he has uh, consented to speak to us on Life Everlasting. It's a book that he has written. And, uh, and I'll let him introduce his book. But Dwayne was very gracious. We, we had a speaker lined up for tonight. His wife called me last Friday afternoon and said he had had a stroke and he wasn't going to be able to be here. So Dwayne was kind enough and gracious enough to fill in for us and, and, uh, and we were looking forward to hearing from him later in the year but he jumped right in and took care of us. So thank you Dwayne and, and uh, we're glad to have you here. So is that mic picking me up okay? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. Well, I'm happy to be here. My name is Dwayne Crowther. My wife is Jean Crowther. We live out in Bountiful. Uh, we're not native Utahns, but we lived in Bountiful for 49 years and attended BYU for, for five years before that and uh, gone to the University of Utah for four years after that. So we've spent most of our lives in Utah. I'm here to talk about graduation day for you. Uh, it's the end of the school year and people are trying to graduate and uh, they've accomplished their tasks, they've finished their courses and uh, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to try to talk to you about four people who have graduated and gone beyond the veil and in one way or another have left their accounts with us here. And I will read you some of their accounts and then I'll turn over to the back and, and look at a list of other things that we've had. When I wrote Life Everlasting, I took long accounts and chopped them into little pieces and so that there was a pattern of, of multiple witnesses for each thing that I was trying to talk about. And so I've got them pieced together by turning to the back of the book. First one I want to introduce you to is a man by the name of Peter E. Johnson. And he's long gone before we got on, on this earth, but this is what happened to him. September of 1898, he was a missionary. My spirit left the body, just how I cannot tell, but I perceived myself standing some four or five feet in the air and I saw my body lying on the bed. I felt perfectly natural, but as this was a new condition, I began to make observations. I turned my head, shrugged my shoulders, felt with my hands, and realized that it was myself. I also knew that that was my body lying lifeless on the bed. While I was in a new environment, it did not seem strange, for I realized everything that was going on, and perceived that I was the same in the spirit as I had been in the body. While contemplating this new condition, something attracted my attention, and on turning around, I beheld a person who said, you did not know that I was here. I replied, no, but I see you are. Who are you? I am your guardian angel. I have been following you constantly while on earth. I asked, what will you do now? He replied, I am to report your presence and you'll remain here until I return. And he left and came back a little while later. And I'll switch over to another page for that. He informed me on returning that we should wait here as my sister desired to, desired to see me. I was busy just at that time. Presently she came. She was glad to see me and asked if I was offended because she kept me waiting. She explained that she was just doing some work that she wished to finish. Just before my eldest sister died, she asked me to enter into this agreement that if she died first, she would watch over me, protect me from those who might seek my downfall and that she would be the first to meet me after death. If I happened to die first, she wished me to do the same for her. We made this agreement, 
And this was the reason that my sister was the first one of my relatives to meet me. After she arrived, my mother and other sisters and friends came to see me and we discussed various topics. As we would do here on meeting friends, after I had spent some little time in conversation, the guide came to me with a message that I was wanted by some of the apostles who had lived on the earth in this dispensation. And that's another story and I won't read all of that, but they basically said, there are those of your forefathers who are wanting you to go back and do their genealogical work for you. And I'll read just a little bit of what was being said there. As soon as I came into their presence, I was asked if I desired to remain there. This seemed strange, for it had never occurred to me that we would have any choice there in the spirit world as to whether we would remain or return to the earth life. I was asked if I felt satisfied with the conditions here. I informed them that I was and had no desire to return to the fever and misery from which I had been suffering while in the body. After some little conversation, this question was repeated with the same answer. Then I asked, if I remain, what will I be asked to do? I was informed that I would preach the gospel to the spirits there, as I had been preaching it to the people here, and that I would do so under the immediate direction of the prophet Joseph. I was again asked if I desired to remain. This bothered me considerably, for I had already expressed myself as being satisfied. I then inquired why it was that I was asked so often if I was satisfied and if I desired to return. I was then informed that my progenitors had made a request that if I chose, I might be granted the privilege of returning to again take up my mortal body in order that I might gather my father's genealogy and do the necessary work in the temple for my ancestors. As I was still undecided, uh, as I was still undecided, one of the apostles said, we will now show you what will take place if you remain here in the spirit world after which you can decide. And then he had an experience that I've never found anyone else having. When we took, uh, when we returned to the place where my body was lying, I was informed with emphasis that my first duty would be to watch the body after it had been disposed of, as that was necessary knowledge for me to have in the resurrection. I then saw that the elder sent a message to President Rich. So did you get that? First duty that you have after you die is to watch your body till after you've been buried so you'll know where to resurrect. Pay attention to that. You can't forget. Then saw the elders send a message to President Rich at Chattanooga in the due time all preparations were made for the shipment of my body to Utah. One thing seemed peculiar to me that I was able to read the telegrams that ran along the wires as easily as I could read the pages of a book. I could see President Rich when he received the telegram in Chattanooga. He walked the floor wringing his hands with the thought in his mind, how can I send a message to his father? The message was finally sent and I could follow it on the wire. I saw the station and the telegraph operator at Price, Utah. I heard the instrument click the message was received and saw the operator write on the message and send it by phone from Price to Huntington. I also saw clearly the Huntington office and the man who received the message. I could see clearly and distinctly the people on the street. I did not have to hear what was said for I was able to read their thoughts from their countenances. The message was delivered to my aunt who went out with others to find my father. In due time, he received the message. He did not seem to be overcome by the news, but began to make preparations to meet the body. I then saw my father at the railroad station in Price, waiting for my body to arrive. Apparently, he was unaffected, but when he heard the whistle of the train which was carrying my body, he went behind the depot and cried as if his heart would break. While I had been accompanying the body en route, I was still able to see what was going on at home. The distance, apparently, did not affect my vision. As the train approached the station, I went to my father's side, and seeing his great anguish, I informed my companion that I would return. He expressed his approval of my decision and said he was pleased with the choice I had made. By some spiritual power, all these things have been shown to me as they would occur if I did not return to my body. Immediately upon making this choice or decision, my companion said, Good, your progenitors will be pleased with your decision. I asked the question why, and I was told it was their desire that I should return to my body. So he saw very vividly him going and traveling with the body as it was being shipped back and things, but that never happened. He was just shown in, in this kind of experience what would happen if he didn't return. So that's the first experience. Now let me introduce you to another fellow. His name is Henry Zollinger. 
This is later, this is 1920. He was crushed by hay, Derek, in August of 1920 and was in the spirit world for several hours. He said, my spirit left the body and I could see it lying under the Derek and at that moment my guardian angel, my mother and my sister Anne were beside me. My mother died January 31st, 1918 and my sister at the age of four years. I saw that her spirit was full grown in stature and also seemed very intelligent. And it goes on again. Let's see. He recorded that my mother then introduced me to the head of five generations of my father's people, all of whom had believed the gospel. So when one leaves the mortal life to dwell in the world of spirits, he may expect to be integrated and absorbed to his own family from beyond the veil. Now, what I would like to do is go back to the index back here. And what I have done is listed the other experiences that he had. I'm just going to read you the list so that you get an idea. Okay, he was met by his guardian angel, his mother and his sister, when he went into the spirit world. That's the one we read. Circumstances of his death are described. He was introduced by his mother to five generations who had accepted the gospel. He was shown the spirits which would yet come to his family if he was faithful. They were full grown, but in a different sphere. He saw that his sister, who died at age four, was full grown. He saw that people had free agency in the spirit world and that gaining knowledge was the only way to progression. He had his mother warn him of his conduct and tell of future events concerning his brothers. She knew that he was coming back to the earth. Visited his two brothers who were on missions in the spirit world. Learned that some of his ancestors who had had vicarious temple work performed for them were still dormant. Was told by his mother that his father would receive another large record of their kindred dead and that Thomas Sterling would get a record for his dead relations, and he received requests from the spirits that he do their temple work for them. So that's just a list of other experiences that he had, but it gives you a little bit of a, a look at what was going on there. The third, I'm going to do just from the, the index back here. This is a person who came into my office and he had brought a manuscript telling of his life after death experience. And uh, he had been up on a high ladder, way up, probably taller than this roof, fixing in a big warehouse, fixing the lighting system up above. And the ladder fell and he fell. And I was trying to be kind of cautious. And he pulled up his trouser leg and showed me a very mangled leg. And he said, that's what happened as part of the fall. And uh, then he showed me his manuscript, which we eventually, I'm the president of Horizon Publishers and Distributors, we took his manuscript and I edited it and helped him with it and published it in a, as a book that's been very popular called I Saw Heaven. But here's his list of experiences that we covered in this book. His name is Larry Tooley. He had a life review. His earthly impurities were purged. He was shown Earth as a place to experiment and learn. He saw his preparation before coming to Earth, made efforts to meet his wife, viewed the Earth as a small brown ball, was relieved to be away from it, described buildings as softly colored crystallized marble of different colors from one to four stories tall, saw the beautiful home of a woman which she merited through her service to others while on Earth saw homes are spaced out, surrounded by trees. We're talking about the spirit world now. Heard beautiful music coming from every direction and every object. Entered the spirit world unclothed, was dressed in a white robe. Was told his robe was temporary, it would be replaced by a more shimmering one that would reflect his level of glory. He could feel his pre-mortal wife-to-be as they visited together. Spirits communicate by talking telepathically. Telepathy is the purest form of communication. One can also experience emotions. Moved by his guide taking his hand and flying together. Described his premortal travels as thinking of where he wanted to be and journeying there faster than light. There are worlds without numbers to explore. Matter exists and vibrates at different vibrational frequencies. Everyone is searching for knowledge. It's, he began to recall his premortal knowledge. Spirits can absorb knowledge through all parts of the body. 
visiting a spirit world learning center. Spirits can absorb facts from unopened books. Spirits build upon imperfect talents. They are given other talents. By embracing a spirit, he could learn everything about him and his relationship to him. He, as guide, attended his own funeral. He later saw his own mother-in-law at her funeral. They had long family lines sealed together, which enabled families to combine powers and increase glory. He viewed a genealogical center filled with books, manuscripts, and people working there. Priesthood ordinances done by proxy on earth are performed in the spirit world to be validated. Saw agonized souls floating in a thick cloud, thick fog moaning and groaning. Said that if one knew he could never enter where God dwells, it would be hell. Felt golden rays of light which were described as the glory of God. Was brought close to the celestial city of God and described it. The relationship of Heavenly Mother and her sacredness was explained to him. So there's lots of ideas just from that one man here. Okay, the fourth person I'd like to talk about was uh, one that we knew a little bit more intimately. She was our daughter. And she had leukemia. It came on very suddenly. We didn't know what had happened. She suddenly one day just came in and there were bruises on her leg. We wondered if somebody had been hitting her or something, but nothing like that had happened. And then my mother, my wife took her to the doctor and I remember being in our business and answering the phone and she said, honey, the doctor says it's leukemia. And I didn't fully understand what she was telling me there. I understood what she said, but I didn't understand the, the absoluteness of the sentence that she was talking about. Anyway, she was with us for about two months and it became, and we were driving down from, from Smithfield up in, in, near Logan, coming down for treatments in the hospital here, and she was a sweetheart. She didn't cry. They poked her with a lot of needles and did transfusions and things, but she just didn't cry. And she was the sweetheart of the doctors there. Uh, we were asked to go speak at a MN and Gleaner account, remember MN and Gleaners? <laughs> this younger generation doesn't know who they are. <laughs> but we were asked to go up to, to Richland, Washington to to talk to an MN and Gleaner encampment. And we'd driven up in our station wagon, our, our sons who were just barely into grammar school, grade school, were in the very back. And then Lara was on a bed in the in the back seat, and I was driving, my wife was in the middle, and we had a college girl who'd come to help tend our kids while we were giving her talks. So we'd been gone up and given the talks and were coming back. And as we were coming back, why well, we started to have problems there, and let me just kind of read you what was happening here. Lara Jean Crowther passed into the spirit world on September 5, 1966 at 2.10 p.m. just north of Cascade, Valley County, Idaho. Her death occurred as our family, together with Joanne Woodruff, a friend, was returning to Utah after addressing a Richland Stake M.N. Gleaner conference at Field Spring State Park in southeastern Washington. During the first two hours of our trip home that morning, Lara had been content to lie quietly on a makeshift bed in the back seat of our station wagon. During the conference, she had become ill with several symptoms of the acute leukemia, which she had had for about two months. As we traveled, she dozed for a few minutes and then, while seemingly still slumbering, began to toss and turn and carried on an animated conversation with an unsaid being or beings. We could only hear her part of the conversation, of course, but we heard her say in her sweet voice, I can't and I don't want to. It seemed that she was eventually convinced of the necessity of her leaving mortality because she ceased to raise objectives. She soon awoke and sat up and said, Mother, I'm going to wake up soon. At the time we didn't realize the significance of what we heard and we only helped her to lie back down, talk to her a moment, and then encouraged her to go back to sleep. A few moments later she hemorrhaged a small quantity of blood from her mouth which alarmed us further and we began to search for a doctor. 
We traveled for almost two more hours before we found a doctor in McCall, Idaho. During this time, she again hemorrhaged blood and again roused herself from a lethargic slumber just long enough to reassure us by saying, Daddy, I'm going to wake up soon. Then she returned to her sleep or unconsciousness. We didn't know which it was. Dr. Nooks, who examined Laura in the emergency room of the hospital in McCall, was unable to help us and advised us to take her to one of the Boise hospitals where adequate blood and equipment were available. <coughs> we drove about another 20 miles south to Cascade when Laura suddenly sat up. Then her spirit quietly slipped from her body. We found ourselves only two blocks from the hospital there while the, where the attending doctor pronounced her dead. It was not until after her passing that we were able to fully comprehend the meaning of her cryptic conversation and to grasp the reassuring intent of her twice repeated announcement, I'm going to wake up soon. And then, I have to turn back to find How old she was? She was about two months short of turning five. Uh, let me see. 255, 256. I should be able to remember that one of these years. <clears throat> Our sweet young daughter, Lara Jean Crowder, passed away in the early afternoon of Monday, September 5th, 1966. Her spirit slipped from her body as our family was traveling south on Route 55, approaching the little town of Cascade, Idaho. Since a road sign indicated that there was a hospital there, we immediately sought medical assistance. Unfortunately, there was nothing that the doctor could do but pronounce her dead and attempt to comfort us. We spent almost two hours in Cascade reconciling our personal feelings, explaining to our sons Don and Scott about Lara's passing and answering their questions about death and life after death. We also received counsel from the hospital staff and from the local LDS branch president whom we contacted. They explained that there was no mortician in Cascade and the Lara's remains would somehow have to be taken back north to McCall to be cared for. After discussing the various options, we decided the best thing to do would be to put her body in the back, in our, back of our station wagon and drive back to McCall, which we had passed through earlier. This we did laying Lara's body across the back seat on the bed where she had previously been resting. Don and Scott remained in the very back of the station wagon. I was driving, my wife sat in the middle seat. Joanne was on the front passenger side window. Suddenly, as we drove northward, Jean leaned over and quietly said to me, I just saw Lara. She's not a little girl anymore. Jean described her as being a young adult, about 20 years old, with, with long, softly curled blonde hair past shoulder length. She was wearing a beautiful, slim, white dress draped in Grecian style across her shoulders. Her lower arms were bare, and Jean had the impression that her feet were also bare, though she couldn't see them. Jean said, she's more beautiful than I could have ever imagined. Jean had been caring for Lara all morning as we rode in the car. Ever since we began driving back to McCall, she had kept turning around to see Lara's body, trying to comprehend that Lara had truly died. She was concerned about what would happen to her little girl who wasn't quite five years old. After turning back around, she looked across a small meadow towards the forest in the distance. Suddenly, the forest faded and Lara was standing there. She appeared briefly, as if her appearance were a quick snapshot. Lara didn't speak, but Jean could see her smiling. A strong feeling of comfort and a secure feeling that all was well with Lara flooded into her mind. Jean told me how she had to take a few minutes to sort out her feelings to understand what her, what her appearance meant to her before she could compose herself enough to tell what had happened, what she had seen. Jean spoke of the comfort she felt from the experience. She knew for sure that Lara had been received into the spirit world. There was no need for her to worry nor feel concerned for Lara's age or well-being beyond the veil. She knew that Lara had gone on to another glorious place and to another work. I didn't see Lara. But Jean did, and that was sufficient witness and reassurance for me. During the difficult days which followed, the sure knowledge Jean had received strengthened us. It made it possible for us to bury her body because we knew that that wasn't Lara. She had gone on and was happy and progressing. Since then, Lara and several of our children had felt the presence of their sister Lara at special occasions such as baptisms and weddings, when all the other family members had been together together. They had expressed the feeling that everyone was there, including Lara. 
This is especially interesting since her last four children were born after her death. But our family bonds seem to have forged into <coughs> the premortal world and carry on through this mortality to the life which is yet to come. My wife gets weepy. My nose starts to run when I read that. <laughs> Now these other things are written down too, but I won't read them, I've read a lot of them to you. About two years after Lara passed away, I was alone at home, and she came to me. I didn't see her, but I could feel her and heard her speak to me in my mind. And she said that all was well with her. She said that she would be with me to help me in certain times of extra problems and difficulties. And I didn't know what that meant, but I understood that and was pleased with the promise. Time went by, and <coughs> within a year after that, I had a speaking engagement to go out to San Jose, California, and talk to a, a monthly meeting of institute directors and their, their students from the whole Bay Area there. And I went. Brigham Young said, that often there are evil spirits who come and congregate in LDS buildings and attempt while they're in the meetings to try to distract. Perhaps you haven't heard that. That's one of those things that's kind of not spoken about very often, but he said that. When I got there to speak, well, I went up and sat on the stand and I could feel something wasn't right there on the the row that the whole road was full of institute directors and people and, and I'm not sure whether it was one of them or evil spirits had come into the room I just never knew but something was wrong it was affecting me affecting me greatly when I was called upon to speak I just got up and stuttered and stumbled I couldn't really form my thoughts for a couple of minutes then all of a sudden everything was fine I gave my talk, it was well received, and after it was over, lots of people came up to say nice things. Among them were four women who said, we really would like to talk to you privately, could we come see you tomorrow? And so we arranged to get together, and they came. Three of them were released really society presidents, see? The fourth was a brand new convert who just heard six missionary lessons, and that's all that she knew about the church, but she was there. And the three said, we want you to hear what the sisters told us. The sister told them that she could feel my distress and see that I was having problems. Then she saw a young woman come and walk across to where I was talking and merge into my body. And after that, I could give my talk to this fine. Now this was interesting to me because I didn't feel any of that, I didn't know what had happened. But she, could, she saw it very clearly, and she apparently was the only one that saw it. But I was quite certain that that, that had to be Lara, and this was one of those occasions that she was talking about. So that was kind of sweet to me, and I was happy that that happened. As time went on, well, we had some baptisms and some marriages and things like that, and and almost in all of those, why one or the other of our family would come up and say, Lara's here, I can feel her. It wasn't always the same person, it was interesting, but just sort of throughout the family, why even those who hadn't known her while she was alive said, Lara's here, and we could feel it. And then we went for about 25 years, didn't hear anything from Lara. Have a granddaughter who served for a year and a half down in Louisiana, if I can say it like they say it. And uh, she was near the end of her mission, and it was just as all these new <coughs> young sisters were coming into the mission field, and they were using her as a trainer. And so she'd gone to meet with, a, uh, I don't know how many young ladies, but there was one there that was having really serious problems. <coughs> And as she wrote in her letter home, when she said, I just, after it was through, I just sat out on the steps and put my head down on my knees and, and just ached for her. And then as she wrote, she said, suddenly I felt arms going around me. And 
warmth inside me. And the voice said, I'm your Aunt Laura. I like to go out with the sister missionaries. <laughs> so apparently they're quite in tune with our missionary work here, so we go on. Then we didn't hear anything for another couple of years. A couple of months ago, I had that icky stuff that we all got. Did y'all get it too? Where we're coughing and sniffling and, and misery. And it really had a hold of me. I went for about two months just getting it twice and, and couldn't quite really shake it. And one night I just began to cough and I coughed and I coughed and I coughed and I coughed and I couldn't stop and I was really starting to worry. And suddenly, she said, hi, Dad, and she talked to me. We had some intimate moments as father and daughter, and it was sweet. I won't tell you all that she said, but I just want you to know that these things carry on. Well, now, I'd like you to know what it feels like to go and arrive in the spirit world. I turn to a chapter, it's called The Light, the Tunnel, and Meeting the Savior. You won't have that experience. When I, when I wrote Life Everlasting, what I had done, I had already written four other books. And in doing that, I had researched them, and I had researched a lot of things in the church history library, a lot of accounts of pioneers and things like that. I kept finding these neat things, and I said, well, I ought to make a record of that. So I had a pages long list of things on different subjects. And one of those things was a record of life after death experiences. This is before we had the term life after death. No, nobody had coined near death experiences yet. But I knew they were there, and when Jean saw Laura and I didn't, I said, hey, I'm the priesthood holder. How come this is happening? Priesthood holding doesn't have a bit to do with who gets to see. <laughs> you need to understand that. And we don't have the privilege of saying we want to see. But they be on the other side of the veil, come as they see fit and when they're permitted to do so and do what they need to do. And that's sweet. Uh, anyway, I had about 150 accounts that I had taken and I went and went back to the libraries and zeroed them out and came along with a stack that high of stuff and I started reading it and I started to say, hey, a lot of people are having the same experiences here. So I, so I remember in the mouth of two or three witnesses here, shall every word be established. I started cutting them up and putting them in stacks and things so that there's all sorts of stacks as to what was going on in different situations. And uh, what happened is I had studied a, a loaded sample. All my sample were members of the church, were Mormon pioneers. <laughs> And I never found light in the tunnel in any of those experiences. I've come to realize since that that's an experience that non-members or inactive people who, who just have fallen away from the church, they have that. It's always, here's the Savior, now you're going to get sent back. They're being sent back because they have finished their work on the earth. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, uh, this just didn't happen here. But these are people who had had uh, gone into the spirit world, and since many of them had come back, let me read you, these are just a sentence or two, about 10 or 15 people describing what they felt when they got into the spirit world. First one, it felt all the, as though all my concerns, all my pains, and all my worries had left. A whole load had been taken off my shoulders. It was a relaxing feeling as if someone cared. I did not feel alone. Another. There was no worry, no sorrow, no pain. All that was gone. It was like being in perfect understanding, perfect knowledge, perfect love, perfect acceptance. To my delight, I now found that the emotion of fear was non-existent. There was absolutely no worry, no concern, no fear. My primary emotion was a feeling of security. I was alone, and yet I knew I wasn't alone. There was something else there that was encompassing me. I felt warm and serene. Fear couldn't exist in that environment. It was a wonderful feeling. I will never forget the feeling of being totally enveloped in warmth. It was a feeling of warmth, of love, of compassion. It was a tangible feeling, almost physical in nature. This wonderful feeling enveloped me. 
There was no pain and I was relieved of all troubles from this earth. It was a wonderful feeling to be without pain or responsibilities. The peace I felt was wonderful, a perfect tranquility and warmth, for I was surrounded by an unconditional love. The love was everything that I had hungered for but had been unable to find in life. All the anger, hate, pain, and fear that I had previously felt were removed. Pure love and peace were all around me. Then she said, I need to describe for you the feelings I had there. She proceeded to tell her her feelings of peace and love and happiness, that the pain was gone. She said, I had no pain. That's about 10 different experiences. I'll read you a few more. I felt very warm, content, and happy. I had never felt like that before. It was just a beautiful feeling. I had never felt so accepted, so loved, and so calm. It was like all the beautiful things in my life intensified a trillion times. It was nothing I have ever seen or felt before. And love doesn't even begin to describe what I felt, but it's the only word I know to explain the sensation. I knew I was standing, but not on the floor. I felt just like me with this wonderful feeling of calmness. No pressure, no frustration, no worries. I had never felt such an overwhelming sense of peace and acceptance and total love. There was not judgment, just mercy and acceptance. Peaceful, calm, real, existing. One last one. When I left my body, I was encompassed with a higher power. It felt like complete wholeness, tranquility, and peacefulness. Definitely love, definitely. There are no words in the English language to describe it. It's more than love. The word love is just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. It was everything. It was an accumulation of everything that ever lived, like the trees, the flowers, every human being, animals, anything that lives or breathes, a blade of grass. It was a totality of everything. And when I came back into my body, I knew that everything had its place, its purpose, and there was a reason for everything. Even poor children that die of cancer at a young age, somebody's life that is taken, everything has a reason, but you don't know that is until you are on the other side. So, those are a few excerpts. Good book. If you haven't read it, repent. <laughs> <coughs> Let's philosophize for a little while. You understand about the plan, right? We talk about the eternal plan of happiness. We call it the eternal plan of salvation. It's called the eternal plan of a lot of things, but one of the things is the eternal plan of, what's the word? It starts with the P. <laughs> Probation. <laughs> I'm getting there, folks. I'm getting there. <laughs> You'll get there, too. I think I'm older than most of you. <laughs> No? I'm 81. What are you? <laughs> okay. Sit back. Don't get up and walk around. <laughs> uh, one of the things that we need to realize is that God's plan requires death. That's graduation. That's passing our coursework here to go over there. I call it graduation. This is what happens when we leave here. We finished our work, we graduate. I'm a music major, but I have tests I expect them to be in music or something like that. But that doesn't always work with how it is. Not going to take time to read it, but a number of people who've had life after death experiences have been shown what happened before Earth for them. They saw that they were taken and taught about what, what's going to happen on earth, what they were going to encounter. They're prepared for it. And in some of the experiences, they saw that they had to choose trials that they would endure while they were here on earth. And there's all sorts of things that they could do. One of the things that could happen is if, if you wanted the long life or you chose one kind of trials, if you wanted the short life or you chose the medical route where you're going to be autistic or this or that or the other and you won't live as long and it'll be harder and different but you're through a lot earlier but it's maybe not as easy a life I suspect that there are many people who are sent here and their only mission is to give experience to their parents they're here for two weeks six months a year they pass away and their job here was to to help others. I need to realize that. 
what we need to understand is that everyone has to die and it's part of God's eternal plan. And we rejoice when someone dies. Think of all these descriptions I've read you of what they're experiencing. We rejoice when somebody dies. It's not a sad thing that they've died. When we say, why does God do this to me? You're looking at the wrong person. What's God doing for the person that's passed away? He's being promoted. He's being advanced, right? It's not why it, am I being hurt here because he's, he's dying. It's like when you send your kid away to school. Yeah, you're in an empty nester now, Ray, but, but uh, you're wanting him to have a good experience and everything like that, right? And you rejoice that he's away from you and having that experience. And that's what we should feel when we send somebody to the other side of the veil. And yes, we're sad. We're going to miss a companionship. And sometimes it's tough being a widower or a widow. Sometimes it's tough to lose a dear child. Many of you have experienced that. But still, it's not what God's doing to us. It's what God has done to bless the person who's taken to the other side. If you have that understanding, then all of this white as God business ends. And if you understand that, that we've all agreed to some real trials and had to, what one person was shown, she chose five trials. And they came back and said, that's too many. Cut it down to three. And these could be any kind of trial. We don't know what they are. It could be health, it could be family problems, it could be war, it could be accidents, it could be anything. But we choose our trials there on the other side. And just like we choose to be a, an artist or a, a mechanic or an engineer or whatever, we choose kind of things that are related to our own personal needs. And, and understandings. But now we can't remember them. But we need to all understand that every one of us have chosen trials. We don't understand if we've already had them and passed through them or if they're still lying ahead. But they're there. And why does this happen to me? Because we chose our trials. Remember your, did you hear President, President, uh, not President Nelson, Who's our, our General Authority second in line? Donald H. Donald H. Oaks. Talking about opposition. Right, remember that? How we all have to have opposition. We have opposition so we can grow. We cannot grow. We cannot exercise our agency without opposition. My opposition is that it's getting harder to pull the names out of the hat. <laughs> That's where it goes first. Uh, so see life in that perspective. Understand that we're working the plan, but the idea is that we are going to arrive beyond the veil, having fulfilled our tests, having passed our tests, having done the things that we were assigned to do here, and, and we go on. When Lara came and talked to me here just several weeks ago, she said, it's not time for you to die yet. You've still got important things you're supposed to do. She didn't tell me what they are. I have to figure what up they are, but there's still things that I'm supposed to do. Whatever that means. And I suspect it's the same for all of you. There are still things you're supposed to do, so you kind of need to be looking around there. Well, I haven't done anything but scrape the lid off the top of the, the, the book here, but have you got questions for five or ten minutes? Where can we buy those? Beg your pardon? Where can we buy those books? Well, you know, when he said that, that you could buy all my stuff at Desert Book, that's not true. The stores, bless their hearts, like front lists. That means the stuff that's just barely off the press. And they're set to stock their stores with the books that have just barely come out. There's only a few books that still hang on. You can get Life Everlasting at Deseret Book. It's way down on the bottom corner, and it's not face out. But it's, it's a golden oldie. It was written in 1967. It's more than 50 years old. But it, you need to have a little history here. It came out in 1967 and was rapidly assimilated by much of the LDS population. And it wasn't until almost Ten years later, we got on Death and Dying by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and 
Return from Tomorrow and all of those other books. Remember the whole bunch of them came along and they came flowing in and, and uh, there were hundreds of them, literally. And some are still being collected and written. If you have experiences that you have written up for your family, I'd love to have them. I'm starting to collect for another book. But the point being that that most of your things you can't find that are that are backlist. So we are, we have a bookstore uh, as President Verizon Publishers for 40 some years. Why we published over 800 books. And we still have about 500 of them with some stock. And so we have a little bookstore and you can order them there. So you go to ldshorizonpublishers.com and you can see them all there. You'll also find that my wife is, is the one lady in the church that makes the kind of cross stitch patterns for all the temples. She's designed patterns for more than a hundred of them. <coughs> so every day the phone's ringing or here comes an order for, we want the, the Provo City Center Temple. That's the hot one right now. Uh, she spent the last several days starting to draw up the design for the Star, Star Valley Temple. And uh, so she's got her finger on the pulse of what's happening here. And you can find all her things there too. Okay, so that, did that answer your question there? What, other questions? Yes? You mentioned, I think, if, I'm, if I understood you right, that LDS people don't see a light when they have a near-death experience. Uh, no, people do. Uh, that's a generality. It's tough to say, oh, yes, people don't do this or don't do the other. Basically, that's an experience for those who have not finished, completed their work and, and uh, are being sent back. We find that the LDS people are passing right into paradise. There are entry places to receive you, and they're they, you, it's just kind of like you go to a certain temple and you have a temple experience where there are, there are places that many people are received when they pass beyond the veil. And they have uh, people there recording your names and your data and stuff like that and you're met by, by those who are waiting for you. So it's, it's different for every person. But basically what we find is that good faithful members of the church are passing right into paradise and not having the light and tunnel experience. Somebody might have that. I, I can't say nobody has it. You know, it's a matter of that person's personality and background and things like that. But the fact that I found 150 or so of, and not a one of them that had that experience tells me, and, and I've watched that over the years. Uh, I just haven't found other LDS people having that experience. But it's, it's a generality that I've done. It's not absolute. Another question. The book I am associated with of yours is I Saw Heaven. And I thought that was so fantastic. And this man that falls from this ladder and smashes his body all the pieces on cement and then goes on and he goes into the hereafter and here's this great big group of people uh, all in white. And out of this group comes this one woman just running and running and running and she's extra, extra white. And she comes up and she says, I'm your little sister. I died when I was three years old. Because I had progressed so far in the pre-existence, it wasn't necessary for me to turn around and go through this uh, pre-mortal life and study and trouble it out. And she pointed out that it was a privilege to die, and she was permitted. And I have come with several people that have lost little children. And I tell them that story and buy the book and read it and let them realize and when they're little two, three, four, five, eight, nine, ten year old child makes a terrible mistake and gets electrocuted or grounded or hit by a car or something, they were permitted to die. And it's uh, by, by God's hand. And uh, they progressed so far. And I thought that was unbelievable. Well, anyway, he goes and talks to the council and talks and raves and raves and raves, and they let him come back to tell them right the story. But I thought that's a wonderful thing. We had two missionaries. In our, in our old ward, a uh, young man came out on a mission, did a fantastic job, came home and, and uh, working in the same pizza bar, going home Saturday night, and a car t blows him and kills them both, bang, right now. Well, the state, the world, they, they were sick. But you look and, and read, I saw heaven, it was a privilege. 
It was a privilege. They were permitted because they have progressed so far. They were permitted to die. And I think that uh, I saw heaven will help so many people realize what you have just <coughs> confirmed tonight. It's an excellent book, isn't it? That's the one I, I turned to the back. That's Larry Tooley, and I read you down the list of experiences from that book I quoted in this book. So I agree with everything you're saying. It's, a, it's an excellent read for you. You'd all deserve to get it. Another question? Yes. What's your take on guardian angels? Are they family members? Or do you have a uh, there are different opinions as to what happens, but I think that there's a, queer, a clear indication <coughs> that everyone has at least one guardian angel who's assigned to keep track of us, to keep track of where we were born, where we died, who our parents were, all of those relationships. So all of that data is preserved and is available beyond the veil. Uh, obviously, we have family members who are assigned to, to watch over us, like, like Laura. And I would assume that you probably have some from your family, too. Uh, enough said. <laughs> Okay, other questions? Yes? Are you familiar with Art, Art, Art and Gibson? Yes, I published five of his books. Oh, Good man. Yeah, so. If you, if you read an Art and Gibson book, you have a well-researched, carefully prepared book on life after death. And I've quoted some of the things from his materials here, too. You need, life Everlasting came, back in, came out in 1967, and before those other books had happened, why were Several hundred thousand copies have been sold. It's sold over a half a million copies now. But uh, in 1997, it was published by Bookcraft. In 1997, when Bookcraft was sold to Deseret, why they released the copyrights on a lot of the golden oldies, and this was one of them. And having a publishing company, I wasn't about to let the book go out of print. But at that time, why I added about 175 pages to the book of all those pearls I'd found over the 30 years while well, they had it. And so that if you can go and get it at DI for somebody that's passed away, but you're missing all the good stuff to <laughs> if you're not getting that. Another question. Has, yes, ma'am. It has non members experiences in order Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of the experiences I've added are non-member experiences. Uh, we don't have any corner on dying. It seems like other people in other faces are also dying <laughs> and having experiences. Okay, last two questions. Or have we had them already? I saw in your book that uh, you have something in there on suicide. I have a friend that they lost their son to suicide. Uh, suicide's a problem. Uh, I can't give you the definitive word because it apparently is handled a little bit differently. It's just like a bishop takes it and takes a problem and, and works it the way he could. That's kind of what's happening with suicides, I think. We just can't flatly say, oh, suicides do this or that or the other. Because there's all these circumstances that leads up to that. Yeah. Uh, some people think they go to heck, is that right? You know who goes to heck? Yeah, Those who don't believe darn. in gosh. <laughs> I thought it was if you say darn. <laughs> okay. I just want to bear you a testimony that, first of all, the things I've told you are true. Subject to my memory as they <laughs> go down through. Let me, tell you, let me show you one more experience if I could. I have a son who's now 50. 54. Bill. Bill? Uh-huh. He's in his 47, Bill. <laughs> oh. He's shrunk. <laughs> uh, when I was in my youth, we'd had five children already. I was sitting in my living room and I could feel somebody come and stand beside me. And a voice spoke to me and said, Daddy, I need to be coming soon. You need to you and mother need to get me started. 
and my name is to be William Orson Crowther, which is interesting because that was the name of my grandfather and uh, a distinguished man who did lots of church things and stayed president and helped build the Mason Temple and lots of things. Anyway, nobody in the family, and he had, he had ten children. My dad's the youngest, and so <coughs> my sister, my older sister, my younger brother, and I are the almost the last three of all the descendants in that downline. Uh, but uh, it's interesting that none of those others had ever taken that name. But that's that tells us that they come, in many cases at least, knowing what their names to be. And uh, I, I don't know if that <coughs> happens for everybody. There's a lot of things that start out up in the pre-mortal world that get down here and it's all fouled up. Uh, John Taylor wrote and talked about how we had chosen our, our mates before we came down here. But I suspect there's a way of a lot of families that don't manage to get together with their mates. They kind of get anxious and they do this or that or the other and they don't find the one. So we can't say that that's destiny and there's nothing that says that that mate is going to be the best one for us. Uh, we try to do our best when we choose our partners down here and, and look how well you women have done. They, he chased you till you caught him, didn't they? <laughs> didn't he? Uh, but that's the way it is. Anyway, you know about him. I just want you to know that the business of seeing beyond the veil is something that happens to, I would say, the majority of people that are your age. How many of you have had some kind of near-death experience? See, at least half of you. And that's about the way it is. There's probably others that didn't raise their hand. But you've had some kind of experience and you you have seen beyond the veil or been visited from, by somebody from beyond the veil. And that's commonplace. And it's not a Mormon thing. It's a all over the world thing. And uh, again, we don't call the shots on it. They beyond the veil come when they see we have a need. And it can be a need in anything from where I can't find the recipe to watch out that car is about to hit you move. Uh, it can be any of those things. But those things happen, and that's true. And it's in the broader spectrum, it's part of the gospel plan and ties in very closely with those things that that happened, we know it. Uh, I bear you that witness as a temple worker and see that it happens within the temple too. And I do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.